Yes, hello everyone. Yes, somebody please ping me if I'm audible so that I can start the session. Good evening, Vaishali. Good evening, Uvasri. Guys, somebody please ping me so that I can start the session. If I am audible. Good evening, Kiruba. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unacademy, India's largest online learning platform. Let's crack UPSC CAC English. Now, before I start with a very major topic, that is moderates, let me introduce myself for the people who are new on the platform. My name is Alok Ocha. I've done my engineering from Pune. I have been associated with the field of UPSC since past six years. I have been through various stages of civil services exam. I hold the experience of giving serious SSB twice. I also hold the experience of exams like CAPF Assistant Commandant and Uttar Pradesh PSC. I'm involved into the field of teaching since past four to four and a half years, and I've mentored more than 10,000 students for UPSC. Now, basically, there might be question in the mind of an aspirant, why one should prefer as a platform for online learning? So here are the ample of reasons why one should prefer an academy as a platform for online learning. First of all, you will have daily life classes on the Unacademy platform. Unacademy offers you assimilation of top and dynamic educators of India on a single platform. You can directly interact with the educators. You can clear all sorts of doubts with the educators. Second most important aspect, which I personally believe is very important for an aspirant. That is developing competence or competitiveness. Now, why competence or competitiveness is important? I'll give you a very small example. Each year, approximately around 8 to 9 lakh aspirants fill up the form for UPSC. Out of which 3 to 4 lakh appear in the prelims exam. Out of which 10 to 11,000 qualify the prelims exam. 3 to 4,000 qualify the mains exam. And finally, 800 to 1,000 make into the final list. So if I filter it down, how many students filled up the form? It was around 8 to 9 lakh. How many made into the final list? It is approximately around 1000. So we need to understand one important aspect that one aspirant is competing with 800 to 900 other aspirant. And that is why it is necessary for him to develop that sort of competitiveness or competence. And that can be done through by going through live tests and quizzes. Then all the courses on an academy platform are highly structured in nature. And there is a proper timetable through which the courses are being conducted. And one can have unlimited access to the courses on an academy platform. These are the few top and dynamic educators of India from whom you are going to learn through. These are the courses being offered on the an academy platform. Subscribe to an academy and use my code AKOUS. I repeat the code AKOUS. Now, there is also something called as iconic subscription. What is iconic subscription all about? I'll give you a very small example. Suppose you are a beginner and you have you have started preparing for civil services. Now, the preparation is completely directionless because you do not know how much time should be dedicated to a particular subject, which NCRT should be read, the old one or the new ones, which option should be chosen up, how much time should be given to current affairs, how much time should be given to newspaper reading, what is the importance of answer writing? Who is going to evaluate your answers? What is a proper technique for writing these answers? So there would be a personal coach for you guys. There would be a personal teacher who would be guiding you throughout the process, throughout your journey for civil services preparation. And that is nothing but iconic subscription. If you choose me as your mentor for uh, iconic subscription, I would be guiding you throughout the journey for civil services preparation. So please use my code AKOUS. I repeat the code AKOUS. <coughs> Good evening, Sarfaraz. Good evening, Raghupati. Good evening, Kiruba. Good evening, Anshu. Good evening, Satya. Good evening, Shipra. Good evening, Supriya. Good evening, Shashank. 
okay so let's get started with today's one of the most important session on moderates now let us understand about the moderates okay now i'll give you a brief background just about one minute of what we have discussed yesterday now indian national congress was formed in 1885 to be very precise and specific it was formed on 28th december 1885 at gokulda tejpal sanskrit college in bombay now it is said that prior to indian national congress there were many other organizations other associations in different presidencies of india that is bombay presidency madras presidency and bengal presidency now these pre congress organizations had created a wave of nationalism in the country they had played a role of uniting the people against the common alien rule that is against the britishers but final shape was given by formation of indian national congress in 1885 and the major role that was played in the formation of indian national congress was by alan octavian hume a retired british civil servant now the first session of the indian national congress was to be held initially at pune but there was an outbreak of an epidemic in the form of plague and cholera that is why the venue was shifted to bombay and the first session of the indian national congress was held at a place called as bombay and it was and it was presided by vomesh chandra banerji initially the first session was attended by 72 delegates and majority of the delegates were from madras presidency now in the first session of the indian national congress the policies of the britishers were heavily criticized by the delegates that came from nook and corner of the country that came from various parts of the country the second session of the indian national congress was presided by grand old man of india whose name was dada bhai nauroji and in the second session of indian national congress the participants were approximately around 436 so the participants were increasing with each successive sessions of the indian national congress and in the second session of the indian national congress it was decided that we are going to meet every year at a particular place so that we can discuss the common issues which are facing our country and this was decided in the second session of Inter indian national congress the third session of the indian national congress was presided by badruddin tayyab ji and he was the first minority president of the indian national congress session now it is said that by 1890 the number of congress delegates the number of delegates to the sessions of the indian national congress had increased to 2000 and more than that okay now right from the start itself the congress was divided on the and there were two section of the people in the indian national congress one was moderates and the other was extremist the name itself suggests moderates they believe in steady progress they believed in gradual progress and the other section was extremist they wanted independence immediately they believed that we are ready to govern ourselves so there were two sections right from the start that is moderate section and the extremist section but for the initial 20 years after the formation like indian national congress was formed in 1885 from 1885 till 1905 majorly the indian national congress was dominated by moderates and now what strategy did the moderates used the first strategy that they used was to arouse the consciousness and the national spirit among the people to unite the people on the common political question i'll give you a very small example either it be a bengal presidency or it be a madras presidency or it be a bombay presidency the rules and regulations were framed by secretary of state for india and viceroy of india and the respective governors of that presidency there was very little involvement of indians in the rule making or policy making process now these rules and regulations were being framed for whom they were being framed for we india so it is the responsibility and the duty of the britishers to involve indians into the, into the decision making process but britishers did not do this so 
So that is why moderates played a very important role in sensitizing the people that these rules and regulations are framed for us. And since these rules and regulations are framed for us, it is our duty to be the part of decision making process. It is a duty of the Britishers to involve Indians into the decision making process. So moderates played a very imp important role in sensitizing the masses about this. And second major role was now initially we have seen various Charter Act like we have seen Regulating Act 1773. We have seen Charter Act 1813 and 1833. Then we have seen Charter Act 1853. Then we have seen Government of India Act 1858. Now, initially, all the rules and regulations were being framed by English East India Company. But after revolt of 1857, the rule of company in India was replaced by rule of crown in India. Okay. Now, what was one of the major aspects? All the rules and regulations were framed without taking, without keeping Indians at the center. Isn't that so? I'll give you a very small example. Suppose if we have to make a rule for if you have to make a law for improvement of industries in a particular region, okay, which is not that developed. First of all, then as a part of rule making process or law making process, the people of that region should be involved in law making process. Why? Because these people are highly aware about the grassroots realities of that region. Similarly, one of the major demands or one of the major methodology that moderate use was to convince the Britishers that you need to introduce reforms in India and that reforms needs to be driven by Indians themselves and not by the Britishers. Because Indians are quite aware about the grassroots realities of India. Okay. So this is all about the strategy or the methodology that was used by the moderates initially. Yes, guys, did you understand this? Please let me know so that I can move further. Any query, any doubt? Yes, please. Yes, guys, please let me know so that I can move further. Okay, thank you. Now, let us talk about important moderate leaders. And these leaders are very important from exam perspective. Time and again, there have been questions in the examination about the moderates and extremist leader. Like there are questions in the UPSC exam, which among the following leaders are moderates? which among the following leaders are extremist. And sometimes there are questions about specifically about a particular moderate leader or about particularly about an extremist leader. So here we are going to discuss important moderate leaders now. Okay. It is a bit factual in nature, but we need to remember about this. Now let's talk about Vomesh Chandra Banerjee or WC Banerjee. The first session of the Indian National Congress was held at a place called as Bombay in 1885 and that was to be very specific on 20th 1885 and it was held at Gokuldas Tejpal Sanskrit College. The first session of the Indian National Congress was presided by Womesh Chandra Banerjee and it was attended by 72 delegates and majorly these delegates were from Madras Presidency. Now Womesh Chandra Banerjee was the first Indian to contest for elections of British House of Common. Like presently in India, we have a parliament and in parliament, we have two houses that is Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Similarly, at that time in the British parliament, there were two houses, House of Lords and House of Commons. So basically, he was the first Indian to contest for the election of House of Commons, although he lost the election. And one of the major purpose for fighting the election was he can enter into the British Parliament and ask the parliamentarians to make rules and regulations for India uh, to frame policies which are Indian centric, not to fulfill the colonial aspirations of the Britishers. That is why he wanted to enter into the British Parliament. 
Now, he was also the, uh, what we say, President of Indian National Congress for the 1892 session at Allahabad. So, basically, he was the President for the Indian National Congress twice. That is for the first time in 1885 and then for the second time in 1892 at Allahabad session of Indian National Congress. Now, one of the, one of the way, basically, to criticize the policy of the government is through print media. And at that time, there were many, what we say, vernacular newspaper, which were using print media as a platform for sensitizing the masses against the policies of the government. Okay. Now, there was one of the journalists whose name was Surendranath Banerjee. And Surendranath Banerjee had a vernacular newspaper, Bengali. Now, he used Bengali to sensitize the masses about the exploitative character of the Britishers that were they were playing in India about the drain of wealth, how they were systematically driving out India's resources out from India, how they were exploiting each and every section of the Indian society. So Surendranath Banerjee was sensitizing the masses through his newspaper Bengali and court already had passed an order that nothing should be published which is derogatory against the interest of the Britishers. But Surendranath Banerjee kept on sensitizing the masses. So he was charged with contempt of court and W.C. Banerjee, like he, what we say, protected him against these charges. So this is majorly about Bhumesh Chandra Banerjee. Yes, Satya, like your question is, what were the way to introduce reforms in India by the Britishers? Like, as I've told you, like after Government of India Act 1858, the rule of company in India ended and the rule of crown was, the rule of crown came in India. Now majorly the rules and regulations were framed by the British Parliament because India was a colony of Britain. So at that time, it was thought that we leaders should enter into the British Parliament so that we can make rules and regulations, we can make laws which are good for the Indian people which are better for the administrative development of India. Hope so, Satya, I have answered your question. Good evening, Ram Kumar. Yes, sir, Faraz. Swarajist and no changers that we are going to study after non-cooperation movement. Okay. Swarajist and no changers, pro-changers, all these topics will, will come after Chori Chora incidents. That is after non-cooperation movement. That we are going to study again in detail. Okay, sir, for us? Okay. Now, let's quickly move up with the next important leader. <coughs> Firoz Shah Mehta. Now, Firoz Shah Mehta was what we say lawyer by profession. And he is also called as basically Lion of Bombay. He had his own newspaper referred as Bombay Chronicle. And as I've told you uh, earlier, previously in the socio-religious reform movements, that majorly the newspaper was used as a medium by the reformers to sensitize the masses. So Bombay Chronicle, the, <coughs> the newspaper of Firoz Shah Mehta, basically was used to sensitize the masses or to sensitize the people about the policies of the Britishers against the policies of the Britishers. Okay, like for example, Rayatwari system was prevalent in the Bombay presidency. But Rayatwari system of land revenue collection was still very exploitative in nature. So Bombay newspaper sensitized the people against the Rayatwari system, sensitized the peasants and the farmers against the Rayatwari system. So Firoz Shah Mehta was one of the champion of social reforms. He was a champion of civil rights in the region of Bombay. And he was a very revered personality. He was a very respected personality among the people of Bombay. Then he was a Parsi Indian leader. He was also the he was also a Bombay Municipal Commissioner. He was also nominated to Bombay Legislative Council, and he was also a member of Imperial Legislative Council. Now, what is Imperial Legislative Council and Provincial Legislative Council? Please try and understand. Like presently, we have the Parliament in the center. And in the states, what we have? Vidhan Sabha and Vidhan Parishad. So the parliament was Imperial Legislative Council. And the Vidhan Sabha or Vidhan Parishad is what? 
that is provincial legislative council so basically firoz shah mehta was also one of the members of provincial legislative council and later on he became the member of imperial legislative council so like he was also what we say president of the indian national congress in 1890 session of the calcutta session okay now when i will be discussing about the surat split of 1907 i will be talking about one of the major role that was played by bal gangadhar tilak ji and firoz shah mehta surat split okay see satya good evening dipesh see uh, like at that point of time basically these people were also educated in the london these people were also educated abroad so basically they were full of western ideas and at that time uk was a very rising democracy okay so many people contested for the election like i'll give you a very small example there was a person called as edmund burke and edmund burke was an irish personality but still he was a british member of parliament got the points clear satya yes dada bhai navroji was also part of it yes dipesh very good okay vaishali i'll repeat the legislative part like see there are two like i'll give you a very small example so that you can easily understand the concept like presently we have parliament at the center and at the state level we have vidhan sabha or vidhan parishad so at the center the rules and regulations are being framed by the parliament and at the state the rules and regulations are being framed by vidhan sabha or vidhan parishad similarly at that time there was imperial legislative council which was at the center and the other was provincial legislative council which made rules and regulation for the provinces or for the presidencies hope so vaishali i have answered your question <coughs> now let us understand important aspect of justice rana day we have already discussed about justice rana day and his role majorly in pune sarvajanik sabha prarthana samaj and so on he was one of the champion of social reforms in the region of maharashtra rather than saying a champion of social reforms in the region of maharashtra he was a champion of social reforms in the region of western india he played a very major role in sensitizing the masses first time like initially he played a role in clearing all the social evils from the society like he fought against the various practices like uh, child marriage he fought against the system of sati he fought for the rights of women or he fought for the rights of widow like he formed vidwa ashram sang so basically justice ranade played a very major role in what we say reforming the society and is also considered as, as a champion of social reforms in the region of western india he was a judge of bombay high court and initially he was one of the founding members of indian national congress now please pay proper attention to me i have repeated this concept time and again but still this concept is very important so that i have to repeat it again and again now there is something called as commercialization of agriculture now what is commercialized agriculture commercialized agriculture basically means production of those crops which are high in demand in the national and international market so the european planters forced our indian people to cultivate commercial crops like cotton and indigo suppose i am a farmer i am a cultivator and i am cultivating cotton now initially british uh, britishers have told me i am giving an example initially britishers have told me that we are going to buy this cotton at rupees 5 but when the cotton is ready for the harvest britishers are telling me that you have to sell this at rupees 1 now i am forced to sell this cotton now this cotton will go to manchester or liverpool then it will go to london where it where it is converted in, into a manufactured textile and again it will come back to india now systematically india's money is driving out of india and this theory for the first time was highlighted by dada bhai navroji now i'll give you a very small example even today our village economy is heavily dependent upon agriculture 
and agriculture even in the 21st century is heavily dependent upon monsoon for example britishers took this cotton to london rather than taking this cotton to london they could have established factories in india itself now what would happen if they could have established factories in india first of all the cost of the final product could have been reduced and secondly the un like the people were also facing the wrath of unemployment they were facing the wrath of poverty so if there is establishment of industries and factories in india itself so basically what will happen at least when there is a failure of monsoon people can work in the industries people can work in the factories but britishers did not do this so so justice ranade highlighted the flaw for the first time and he said that there should be establishment of heavy industries for economic progress of india and i have already talked about this that he was a founding father of many institutions like prarthana samaj pune sarvajanik sabha deccan education society social conference movement and so on and he was a political guru of gopal krishna gokhale okay <clears throat> yes satya perfect now pay proper attention surendra nath banerji now let us understand about surendra nath banerji like it is said that he was the first indian journalist to be imprisoned and i have already talked about why he was imprisoned like at that time there were many newspapers there were few english newspaper and many bengali newspaper sorry many vernacular newspaper so surendra nath banerji had one newspaper called as bengali and he used bengali newspaper as a platform to sensitize the masses and basically he wrote something derogatory about the britishers he wrote about the exploitative character of the britishers so this was not liked by the britishers and for the first time surendranath banerji was the first indian journalist to be imprisoned he cleared the civil services examination twice for the first time like it is said that like few historians believe that there was an issue with the age okay like he had crossed the age limit when he was selected like few historians have highlighted this fact and few historians believe that he did not appear for the horse riding test and although after being getting selected into the civil services he was debarred from the service so there are different views associated with this fact okay for the second time when he qualified the civil services examination basically okay uh like for the second time there was a problem with the age and so on okay now initially he was posted as an assistant magistrate in east bengal region and when he was working as the assistant magistrate he came to know about the various flaws of the execution of the policies okay i'll give you a very small example like there were tribal movements if you remember some of the tribal movements i have talked about this that britishers wanted to construct a road <coughs> basically to connect the northeastern part of india to the region of bengal okay now this road had to be passed to the region of east bengal that is present day bangladesh and for this many of the land of the tribals were taken the forest were cut down and the forest were cleared basically so what happened basically in that case basically british has started using the exploitative nature for like against the tribals so this person when he was working for the uh in when he was working in the selet district that is in the present day region of bangladesh he came to know about the way in which the policies were executed like each and every section of the indian society was suffering the plight of the policies of the britishers and now he decided to work for the cause of indians and he was very much inspired by edmund burke i have just highlighted about edmund burke while back edmund burke was a philosopher he was a thinker and he was a person full of liberal ideas he was an irish member and he was a part of the british parliament now i'll i'll highlight a very small incidents although edmund burke was a part of a british parliament
बट स्टिल ही अपोज कोलोनाइजेशन ऑफ अमेरिका बाय द ब्रिटिशर्स ब्रिटेन इज अ डेमोक्रेटिक कंट्री एंड इट शुड ट्रीट द अदर कंट्रीज इन अ डेमोक्रेटिक मैनर इट शुड रिस्पेक्ट द सॉवरनिटी एंड इंटीग्रिटी ऑफ द अदर कंट्रीज रैदर देन फॉलोइंग द पॉलिसी ऑफ इंपीरियलिज्म एंड कोलोनाइजेशन सो ऑल दो ही वॉज अ पार्ट ऑफ अ ब्रिटिश पार्लियामेंट ऑल दो ही वॉज अ मेंबर ऑफ ब्रिटिश पार्लियामेंट स्टिल ही अपोज वेरियस पॉलिसीज ऑफ ब्रिटेन ओके सो सुरेंद्र नाथ बैनर्जी वॉज वेरी मच इंस्पायर्ड बाय द राइटिंग्स ऑफ एडमिंड बुर्के लाइक लाइक एडमिंड बुर्के ऑल्सो हाईलाइटेड द आइडियाज ऑफ फ्रेंच रिवोल्यूशन लाइक लिबर्टी इक्वालिटी फ्रेटर्निटी एंड सो ऑन गेरिंग द पॉइंट क्लियर सो बेसिकली सुरेंद्र नाथ बैनर्जी or like he implemented the same model in india he was a very liberal personality he did not care for what britishers think about him he worked for the upliftment of the indian society and for the betterment of the betterment of the indian administration that is why now he was also a person who opposed partition of bengal now there was a viceroy whose name was lord curzon and i have told you initially right from the start itself that britishers always followed two policy in india one was divide and rule and the other was carrot and stick policy now lord curzon wanted to divide the entire bengal so that he can break the communal harmony in the region of bengal i'll give you a very small example now lord curzon wanted to partition the of bengal partition the bengal on the pretext that Bengal was too big to be administered, and it cannot be administered by a one governor general. That is why Lord Curzon said that we are dividing the region of Bengal into two parts. That is East Bengal and West Bengal. But what was the hidden agent or hidden intention behind that? West Bengal majorly had a Hindu population, and East Bengal majorly had a Muslim population, and at that time. hindu muslim unity was very intact and to break the communal harmony of india to break the hindu muslim unity he decided to partition the bengal and surendranath banerjee completely opposed the partition of bengal that was initiated by surendranath banerjee sorry initiated by lord curzon got the points clear so like swadeshi movement was started post uh, what we say announcement of partition of bengal we are going to discuss about swadeshi movement in depth in detail there would be a very separate session for partition of bengal and swadeshi movement so that you will come to know how swadeshi movement uh, what we say spread to the various parts of the country and so on so basically surendranath banerjee played a very major role in this and after swadeshi movement basically britishers came up with a new act which is also called as morley minto reforms of 1909 and he supported this so he is also called as basically indian burke because he was sensitized by the philosophy of edmund burke so the points are clear guys yes shubhra i will upload the pdf of jainism in the uh, what we say the telegram channel i will upload it soon immediately after the lecture yes sir faraz very good like hindu and muslim tied rakhis on both their like on each other hand to maintain the communal harmony yes very good now let's talk quickly about g subramanyam ayer Yes guys i have one what we say uh, information for you guys like few students who have not attended my session on buddhism in the ancient india as a part of art and culture i am conducting a special class on saturday just for the topic of buddhism okay i have completed or covered the topic of jainism as a part of special class on the an academy platform so once again i will be covering the topic of buddhism there so students who haven't appeared like who haven't watched my lecture uh, on youtube can please attend my session on saturday on the an academy platform at 9 o'clock in the morning it would be 3 hour session completely on all the important facets of buddhism 
okay and one more reminder on sunday you have a test guys okay of modern india now let's talk about g subramanyam iyer now i have told you basically about various pre congress organizations yesterday we have discussed about various pre congress organizations okay like there were organizations in various parts of india in various presidencies of india like there were uh, pre congress organizations in the region of bengal presidency free, uh, few pre congress organization in madras presidency and few in the bombay presidency so one of the what we say in the madras presidency was madras mahajan sabha and one of the major role was to preach nationalism among the people of madras and i have already discussed about what is nationalism now there are two terminologies state and nation state basically defines a political boundaries of a country but nation basically means a feeling of belongingness towards one's country and that is nationalism basically so madras mahajan sabha played a very major role in sensitizing the masses in the region of southern part of india and specifically the madras presidency g subramanyam g subramanyam uh, g subramanyam iyer played a very uh, what we say exemplary role in this and he founded two newspaper one was the hindu other was swadesh mitran hindu was an english newspaper swadesh mitran was a tamil newspaper and he was uh, as i have already uh, spoken about this that the first session of the indian national congress was attended by 72 great delegates okay and these delegates were majorly from madras presidency and the person who represented these delegates was g subramanyam iyer and it is also said that he worked against completely against the system of untouchability got the points clear now let's quickly move with dada bhai nauroji ये सत्या नो ऑन सैटरडे गाइस लाइक टुडे वी आर कंडक्टिंग अ लेक्चर ऑन मॉडरेट्स टुडे इज वेडनेसडे ऑन थर्सडे दैट इज टुमारो देयर वुड बी लेक्चर ऑन एक्सट्रीमिस्ट देन डे आफ्टर टुमारो वी आर गोइंग टू स्पीक अबाउट व्हाट वी से दिस स्वदेशी मूवमेंट एंड ऑल इंडिया मुस्लिम लीग ऑन सैटरडे आई वुड बी कंडक्टिंग अ स्पेशल क्लास ऑन बुद्धिज्म ऑन सैटरडे ओके so saturday there would be no lecture on modern india and on sunday again i would be conducting a mock test on an academy platform hope so vaishali and satya i have answered the question are the points clear yes please let me know okay now let's talk about dada bhai nauroji yes satya the test will also cover the topics of swadeshi movement okay dada bhai nauroji we have discussed in detail about dada bhai nauroji previously in one of his theory that is called as drain of wealth theory like i have already talked about the drain of wealth theory that how in a very systematic manner india's money was drained out of india and this was for the first time highlighted by dada bhai nauroji in his book called as poverty and un british rule in india and this is called as drain of wealth theory drain of wealth theory that was highlighted by dada bhai nauroji was further analyzed by many economists of india like r c dat g v joshi and so on but for the first time it was dada bhai nauroji who highlighted this drain of wealth now it is also said that dada bhai nauroji was a part of british house of commons and he represented the cause of indians in the british parliament basically he tried to frame rules and regulation which were always for the betterment of the indian administration and he was the first indian to be a part of the british parliament 
He was the first Indian to be the part of to be a British member of Parliament, and always he was assisted by Muhammad Ali Jinnah in performance of his duties. He also participated in Socialist Second International. Then his secretary, that is Bikaji Kama, participated in the International Socialist Conference in Stuttgart, that is Germany. And here, this conference was attended by many countries which believed in the principles of socialism. And for the first time, the cause of Indian peasants were kept was kept on the international platform. Like there were many famines in India, and already we have discussed various famine commissions. Okay, now <coughs> initially, when Britishers introduced commercialized agriculture in India, they did not do anything worth. to work for the plight of the peasant but when they started feeling that until and unless we provide infrastructural development in india in the form of irrigation facilities in the form of construction of dams there cannot be any improvement in the agriculture in india so <coughs> britishers had their own hidden intention to improve agriculture in india why because indian agriculture products were in great demand in the european markets and the britishers basically were the only supplier in the european markets so they accrued huge amount of profit they accrued surplus profit from this trade getting the points clear so initially they did not do anything to work for the plight of the peasant but when there was failure of monsoon but still there was a great demand of indian crops then they started appointing various famine commission so that the cause of the peasants could be worked upon or the plights of the peasant could be uh, tackled with and for the first time at stuttgart in germany the issue of famine was raised like how the indian subcontinent was facing the problem of famine and british appointed a commission called as royal commission on indian expenditure dada bhai nauru ji himself was a part of this commission and its purpose was basically to study the drain of wealth from india so this is all about grand old man of india that is dada bhai nauru ji okay okay vijay very good information thank you vijay a very good fact and a very good information that g subramanyam ayer was also called as mahakavi a very good information given by our one of our friends Vijay, thank you, Vijay. So, guys, did you understand Dada Bhai Nauru Ji till here? Yes, please ping me. Did you understand till Dada Bhai Nauru Ji? okay now let's talk about gopal krishna gokhale now gopal krishna gokhale was one of the member of governor general's executive council now pay proper attention like after 1858 uh, sorry after the revolt of 1857 the rule of company in india was replaced by rule of crown okay so crown was represented by secretary of state for india now basically the head of all the three presidencies was viceroy and there was a separate governor general of each and every presidency and that like every governor general had an executive council to assist him in performance of his duty so gopal krishna gokhale was a member of the executive council of governor general basically okay so he assisted basically the governor general in performance of his duty now basically i'll tell you one more important fact that we are going to study later moderates one of the most important achievements of the moderate was basically that is getting uh, what we say indian council act of 1892 passed now one of the clauses of indian council act of 1892 says that indians have the right to discuss the budget but they do not have the right to vote upon the budget like for example 
if britishers are spending certain amount of money on buying weapons we indians can discuss that is it necessary to buy weapons if britishers are following the policy of imperialism and colonization and for that they are using the indian resources and if that is highlighted in the budget indians completely had the authority to question that to discuss about that issue although they did not had the authority to vote upon it but still they could discuss and highlight that flaws of the budget so gopal krishna gokhale played a very exemplary role in the budget framing process he was an active participate a participant in the debates that were held on the issue of budget and he was also called to london basically to meet secretary of state that is sir john morley okay now <coughs> now partition of bengal was announced in 1905 by lord curzon and i have already talked about why pa- lord curzon wanted to uh, partition the bengal like he had highlighted that we are partitioning the bengal because it is quite big to be administered but the actual hidden intention behind that was they wanted to break the hindu muslim unity okay so in 1905 it was decided that against the partition of bengal we are going to start a movement that is called as swadeshi movement and the call for swadeshi movement this decision was taken at banaras session of indian national congress and banaras session of indian national congress was presided by gopal krishna gokhale ji got the points clear when the call for swadeshi movement was taken at banaras session of indian national congress the president of that session of the indian national congress was gopal krishna gokhale gopal krishna gokhale is also called as political guru of mk gandhi i'll give you a very small example now when mk gandhi was humiliated in south africa i have already talked about this that mk gandhi was thrown out of the first class railway compartment at peter marichburg station in south africa and then he decided to he decided to ameliorate the condition of indians and asians living in south africa and for the first time in south africa he coined the term satyagraha getting the points i have already talked about this that for the first time mk gandhi was introduced to bhagavad gita in london and he coined the term satyagraha for the first time in south africa and now he decided to work for indians living in south africa now it is said that it's basically englishmen in south africa had passed one law and that law was basically <coughs> the law basically highlighted one thing and that law was any marriages that were not done as per christian rites and rituals were invalid getting the points clear and the children born out of this marriage were illegitimate so this was completely derogatory to the dignity of our indian women and mk gandhi immediately started a movement in south africa against this law mk gandhi also asked his political guru gopal krishna gokhale to sensitize the masses of indians basically in south africa and to sensitize the masses in india about the condition of indians in south africa and at that time gopal krishna gokhale had a word with uh, what we say viceroy at that time and then basically it is said that the law in south africa was repealed so gopal krishna gokhale also played a very exemplary role there like he was also a role model for mohammad ali jinnah because mohammad ali jinnah initially followed his principles initially he followed his style of working basically for developing nationalism fervor in the country that is why mohammad ali jinnah is also called as muslim gokhale okay now he was also uh, later on he became a member of uh, secretary of states council if you remember government of india act 1858 i have told you that the crown would be represented by secretary of state for india and secretary of state of india will be having 15 members to assist him in the performance of his duty and one of the member was gopal krishna gokhale ji got the points yes dipesh political guru of mk gandhi yes sir faraz lord stainley very good
Yes, guys, are the points clear? Okay. Now let's talk about Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya. Now, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya initially was a moderate, but later he became an extremist leader because he was dissatisfied with the policy of the working of moderates. Now, I'll highlight you one thing. Now, moderates, as I've told you, they believed in patience. They believed that we want independence, but we do not want independence all of a sudden. We want independence in a stage by stage manner. Okay, so they believed in peaceful and bloodless struggle. This was the policy of the moderates that was followed initially. So Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya ji was like he was a part of moderates initially, but he was completely dissatisfied with the policy that was adopted by moderates. He was completely opposed to the politics of appeasement. Now, what is politics of appeasement? Like, for example, I'll give you a small example. Every time to make a law in India, we have to pass, give a petition in the British Parliament. We have to pass a resolution. We have to discuss. And that discussion is highly worthless because the final authority is with the Secretary of State for India and the Viceroy of India. So what is the use of that discussion basically? So Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya was opposed to this. And he believed that sometimes we have to go beyond constitutional limits to gain the independence basically. Now, it is said that there was formation of All India Muslim League in 1906. We are going to discuss that in the further lecture. Okay. Now, initially under the influence of Sayyid Ahmad Khan, Muslim League did not support basically the cause of the Congress. And Sayyid Ahmad Khan was never a part of a Congress. And he asked initially the Muslims not to be a part of the Congress. But there were very exemplary leaders who had developed nationalist fervor like Badruddin Tayabji. He was a Muslim leader, but still he was a part of a Congress. And he worked for developing na uh, nationalist fervor among the nationalists of India. But Sayyid Ahmad Khan initially told Muslim League that basically you shouldn't be the part of the Congress. Now, Lord Curzon, as I've told you, he played the game of divide and rule. Now, what did he told basically few leaders of the Muslim League? Like Aga Khan was one of the member who was the founder of All India Muslim League. Now, what did Lord Curzon told Aga Khan and the founders of Muslim League? That once you support the partition of Bengal, we will develop Dhaka University in East Bengal. This will lead to educational development of Muslim. Then we are going to develop another port called as Chittagong Port in East Bengal. This will lead to economic upliftment of Muslim. But finally, partition of Bengal was cancelled in uh, 1911. And now Muslim League decided to start working with the Congress. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there was one movement like around 1914, there was World War One, And Turkey was on the opposite side of Britain. Now, Britain won the World War I and Britain started imposing harsh terms and conditions on Turkey. Now, Turkey was ruled by a caliph and whatever caliph said, it was followed by all the Sunni Muslims of the world. Now, Britishers started imposing all terms, harsh terms and conditions on the caliph of the Turkey. And this basically hurted the sentiments of Muslims all over the world and specifically the Indian Muslim. And now basically the Muslims and the Hindu uh, Muslims and the Congress decided to work together against a common enemy that is the Britishers. So this is called as Lucknow merger. We will discuss this further in detail in which occurred in 1916. Along with the merger, there was a pact which is called as a Lucknow pact. Pay proper attention. Okay. Now as per this pact, few seats were reserved for minorities that is Muslim. Okay. Now, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya was opposed to this. Now he was opposed to this because of one reason. 
तो वन ऑफ द मेजर रीजन वॉज बेसिकली इफ वी आर सपोर्टिंग इफ वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग वॉट वी से सीट और इफ वी आर रिजर्विंग द सीट दिस इज हाईलाइटिंग वन फ्लॉ टू द ब्रिटिशर्स एंड दैट फ्लॉ इज बेसिकली दैट देर इज अ पैक्ट बिटवीन द कांग्रेस एंड द मुस्लिम लीग एंड दैट पैक्ट इज बेसिकली वॉट that if you give us particular seat then we are going to support you and britishers are already ready to take the undue advantage of this because this highlights what there is no unity among them so that is why to maintain hindu muslim unity he was opposed to this so he was opposed to the separate electorate for muslims under the lucknow pact why because it affected hindu muslim unity and the undue advantage would be taken by whom it would be taken by the britishers okay then he was a president of the congress on two sessions that is 1909 and 1918 La 1909 lahore session and 1918 delhi session in 1934 he left congress and he formed his own party called as hindu mahasabha he was one of the founders basically of congress nationalist party in 1934 then he was completely opposed to the system of untouchability and he worked along with mk gandhi in removing untouchability a social sin okay and he was an active participant of one of the uh, what we say associations that was formed by mk gandhi that is harijan sevak sangh got the points clear guys so this is all about pandit madan mohan malviya so initially he was what an ext uh, moderate and later he became an extremist because he was dissatisfied with the policy of moderates dipesh uh, many of the books highlight that he was a co-founder of hindu mahasabha and many books highlight that he was the founder of mahasabha so we can go with the founder of hindu mahasabha okay dipesh siddhartham yes majorly i am going from uh, mains and prelims perspective both okay yes notes are enough but apart from the notes you should also go for the basic books like the ncert and the tamil nadu textbook okay siddhartham and also go for certain reference book as well like grover and so on yes very good shipra the leader newspaper very good by madan mohan malviya yes indians came to know in a very gradual manner getting the points clear satya indians came to know in a very gradual manner about the policies that were employed by the britishers okay <clears throat> now let's talk about badruddin tayab ji i have already discussed guys about badruddin tayab ji he was an indian lawyer and he was the first minority president of the indian national congress basically he presided the third session of the indian national congress which was held at madras okay then comes dinshaw vachcha dinshaw vachcha was one of the founding members of indian national congress and he was an expert in economics and finance okay now he was since he was a president of indian uh, merchants chamber he became the president later on okay but he was an expert in the framing the policies fiscal policies for india like i have already talked about a person called as mg ranade that he took active part in the budgetary process okay like he took active participation uh, participation in the debates and dis uh, discussions concerning the budget similar was a thing with dinshaw vachcha okay let's move quickly guys raj bihari ghosh now raj bihari ghosh now pay proper attention raj bihari ghosh was the uh, was the president of the indian national congress for two terms that is 1907 surat session and 1908 madras session and surat session is a very important session from the perspective of history we are going to discuss in detail about the surat session what all happened in the surat session but let let me give you a small background about it now when partition of bengal was announced basically by the moderate sorry by lord curzon a call for swadeshi movement was given at banaras session of indian national congress 
which was presided by Gopal Krishna Gokhale. Now, basically, there were two sections, there were two ideologies that were existing in Indian National Congress. I've already discussed about that. One was moderates and the other was extremist. Now, the movement became quite popular in the region of Bengal. Now, moderates wanted basically the movement to be confined in the region of Bengal itself. But extremists wanted that if the movement is successful in Bengal, if people are hugely supporting the movement in Bengal, people will obviously support this movement all over India. So extremists believe that the time is ripe now that we should spread the movement to all the parts of the country. It should not be kept confined just to Bengal. And on this issue, basically, there was a debate and discussion between the two sections of the Indian National Congress. There was division. One was extremist and the other was moderate. Now, there was debate over the presidentship as well. Like who is like moderates wanted either Bal Gang, sorry, extremist wanted 1906 session to be either presided by uh, what we say Bal Gangadhar Tilakji or Lala Lajpat Rai. But moderates did not wanted this. And moderates appointed Dada Bhai Nauruji as the president. Since Dada Bhai Nauruji was a very revered personality, was a very respected personality, extremists did not oppose this. But in 1907, the session which was held in Surat on the banks of river Tapi, now there was a huge what we say debate and discussion. And finally there was a split in the Indian National Congress. And Indian National Congress was now basically divided into two parts that is moderates and extremists. Okay. And basically, who is going to gain advantage of this? Britishers are going to gain the advantage of this. So basically, Raj Bihari Ghosh was the president of the Indian National Congress in 1907 when there was a split in the Indian National Congress into two parts. Okay. Now, it is said that he donated 13 lakh rupees for creation of National Council of Education at Jadavpur, which is in West Bengal. And this later became Jadavpur University. Okay. Now, he was also a member of Bengal Legislative Council and Council of India. That is Imperial Legislative Council later on. So, this is majorly about Raj Bihari Ghosh. There is also a newspaper associated with him. Yes, can anybody, can anybody please highlight? Okay, Kajal, you are from Surat. Very good. See Satya, ideology was existent right from the formation of Indian National Congress. But basically it is said that this ideology, like it is said that uh, this ideology came to the fore in 1907 session of the Surat. Got the points clear Satya? Yes, hope so Satya, I have answered your question. Okay, now let me talk about Anand Mohan Bose ji. Now, Britishers had passed one derogatory act in 1878 that is called as Vernacular Press Act 1878. The name itself suggests the act was completely against which newspaper? The act was completely directed against the Indian newspaper. That is Vernacular Press Act of 1878. And Anand Mohan Bose was an active participant against this act. Okay, I have already talked about that. As per this act, one newspaper overnight became an English newspaper. That is Amrit Bazar Patrika. Okay, initially it was a Bengali newspaper of Shishir Kumar Ghosh. And later on basically it became which newspaper? It became an English newspaper to escape the wrath of Vernacular Press Act 1878. Poor newspaper had to stop the publication as per Vernacular Press Act of 1878. That is Som Prakash, Dakka Prakash, Bharat Mir and Samachar. These newspaper had to stop the publications. Okay. So, Anand Mohan Bose completely opposed Vernacular Press Act because he said that the law should be same for every newspaper. Rather, rather it be an English newspaper 
or it be a vernacular newspaper. If the law is imposed on a vernacular newspaper, similarly it should be imposed on the English newspaper. The law remains the same for all. Okay, so he completely opposed this. He opposed what we say maximum age limit. Like as I've told you, Lord Lytton had reduced the age limit from 21 years to 19 years for appearing into the Indian Civil Services examination. And this was completely opposed by whom? Anand Mohan Bose. He was one of the active participants against the protest meeting of partition of Bengal. We are going to discuss this in detail. And he founded Indian Society in England to sensitize the people of England about the plight of Indians. So this is all about Anand Mohan Bose. So did you understand the important moderate leader? Yes, guys. Yes, Dipesh. Yes, Vaishali, I couldn't get your question. Please repeat the question. Vaishali, do you have any doubt, any question? Please repeat the question or a doubt. Okay. Now let us understand the important demands of the moderates. Okay, now let us go in a step-by-step -step manner. What were the important demands of the moderates? Okay. First was reduction in the land revenue. Now, we'll go a bit fast. There were basically three types of land revenue system. That is Zamindari system or permanent settlement, Rayatwari system and Mahalwari system. Under Zamindari system, English East India Company directly did not collect the revenue from the peasant. A Zamindar was appointed who will connect the revenue from the peasant. Okay. And then the revenue would be given to the English East India Company after keeping his share. So now 89% of the revenue went to the English East India Company and 11% was accrued by the Zamindar. So the entire burden of the taxation fell on whom? The peasant. So one of the major demand here was to reduce the land revenue. Then came the Rayatwari system. Under Rayatwari system, English East India Company directly collected the revenue from the peasant or the farmer. Now basically it is said that if the farmer was unable to pay the revenue, what will happen? His land would be seized by the Britisher. And to protect his land from getting seized, what will the farmer do? The farmer will take the loan from the money lender. So basically the farmer got basically indebted. Got the points? Now still in the Rayatwari system basically land revenue was quite high. And finally came the Mahalwari system of land revenue collection. Now in Mahalwari system revenue was not collected from an individual farmer. The revenue was collected from the entire village. Entire Mahal. Okay. But still in all the three system, the revenue was very high. So one of the major demand was reduction in the land revenue. Secondly, abolition of salt tax and sugar duty. Now, like air and water, salt is one of the most important necessity of life. There is hardly few foods like where salt is not used. And in the coastal areas, salt should be completely free of cost. And Britishers are imposing more and more taxes on the salt. If you remember Surat salt agitation. Guys, I have discussed about Surat salt agitation in the tribal revolt. So basically, rather than making salt free, Britishers are taxing that. So there should be complete abolition of the salt tax. Okay. Then improvement in the working conditions of plantation labor abroad. Now. I'll give you a very small example for this. When M.K. Gandhi went to South Africa, okay, he observed that there were three types of Asians and Indians living in South Africa. That is indentured laborer, ex-indentured laborer and Memon Muslim. Now who are indentured laborer? Indentured laborers were taken from various parts of India and Asia and they were taken to South Africa to work in the plantation fields there. Once their contract was over, they can come back to their own country. 
एक्स इंडेंचर्ड लेबरर्स वर हु वर टेकन फ्रॉम वेरियस पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया एंड एशिया एंड वर टेकन टू वॉट वी से साउथ अफ्रीका और वेरियस अदर प्लेसेस टू वर्क इन द प्लांटेशन फील्ड But once their contract was over, they decided to stay back in South Africa itself. Now, because they felt that we are going to be exploited in South Africa, we are going to be get exploited in India, but still we have employment opportunities here. But the condition of these laborers was very, very tedious. Like they were living in the slum. The conditions were highly unhygienic. They had to work for fourteen to fifteen hours in the plantation fields. now there were many laborers who were working in, as what we say laborers in the industries they had to work for 12 to 15 hours even even women had to work minimum for 10 hours small children above the age of 9 years had to work for 8 to 10 hours then they cannot use the roads that were used by englishmen then they had to carry a passport size of a document suppose i am a laborer working in any of the country then suppose if i have to take a bread okay i have to purchase a bread from a neighboring shop and it is 9 in the evening i had to carry a passport size of document to reveal my identity and if i didn't do that so i would be heavily beaten up by the englishmen such was the condition of the plantation laborers or the laborers that were living abroad and nk gandhi raised the cause of these laborers in south africa so one of the demand was improvement in the working condition of the plantation labor protection of the peasant from unjust landlords i have already discussed about in the raitwari system like for example many a times what happens like in zamindari system the revenue was collected from the peasant the revenue was collected from the farmer now 89% revenue went to the english east india company 11% was kept by zamindar himself now many a time apart from this stipulated and the fixed revenue zamindar collected extra revenue from the peasant he exploited the peasant and collected more revenue are you getting the points clear so basically and secondly in raitwari system what happened to protect his land from getting seized what will the farmer do the farmer will take the loan from the peasant and the farmer now became indebted and the interest charged by this money lender this landlord was very high on the loan getting the points so basically one of the important demand of the moderate was to protect the peasant from the landlord then reduction in the military expenditure now why reduction in the military expenditure britishers and many european countries were following the policy of colonialism now as per the policy of colonialism they were come continuously expanding their territories they were exploiting the people and the resources of the new territories and for that they required military they required arms and ammunitions they required weapons and where will the money come from the money basically came from the indian exchequer now their major demand was to reduce the expenditure on military why because this resources could be used for the welfare of the people it could be it could be used for development of communication and transport system it could be used for development of education it could be used for development of sanitation facilities it could be used for infrastructural development like irrigation and dams that is why there should be complete reduction in the military expenditure then encouragement given encouragement should be given to the modern industries and i have already discussed about why modern industries are important here like i'll give you a very small example like uh, i support rabindranath tagore's point of view in this like mk gandhi initially believed that people should be trained in handicraft people should be trained in charkha so that they can have employment opportunities but rabindranath tagore said that people should be given training for working in the heavy industries because in the era basically of globalization okay now deterministic high precision methods are of utmost importance so what will happen here we need to improve improve the pace of production so that we can catch up with the competitiveness of the entire world that is why encouragement should be given to modern industries okay and there should be direct government help in this government should help out in this okay 
then there should be expansion in the reforms in the legislative council more power should be given to indians i'll give you a small example for example suppose there are in the imperial legislative council there are 10 minister out of 10 minister eight ministers were Brit uh, british officers and two were whom two were indians and that too they were not elected they were nominated and basically who nominated them britishers nominated them and britishers usually nominated the people who were loyal to them like major zamindar industrialist landlords money lenders princes and so on why because these people were loyal to them so now their major demand was increase the number of seats in the imperial legislative council and provincial legislative council and indian should be given greater control over the finance then indianization of government service i have already talked about this for example suppose a civil servant is recruited in london he is trained in london and now he comes to india for initial few years his administrative efficiency will not be up to the mark why because he was born and brought up in london he was trained in london and he is completely unaware about the grassroots realities of india so how will he be able to work for indians basically how will he be able to understand the administrative realities of india so here it was decided to improve the administrative efficiency one of the main demands of the moderate was to indianize the government service associate more and more indians into the what we say a uh, government service and one more benefit would be that when europeans are appointed into the civil services they will charge high salary for that and associating indians would be quite beneficial and it would be quite economical isn't that so and the money that would be left would be used for various welfare activities what the points then opportunity should be given for indians to appear in the civil services examination and this examination should be conducted simultaneously in london as well as in india okay then reimposition of import duty on cotton goods now why reimposition uh, imposition of import duty on cotton goods if you remember the industrialization of indian industries i have discussed one topic now pay attention properly i have told you britishers took raw cotton from the indian peasant it was taken to manchester or liverpool then it went to london and from london it came back to india suppose i'll give you an example so that you can understand this concept easily suppose this raw cotton was purchased at rupees 1 now the final good would be sold in india at rupees 10 okay now if the britishers could have established factories in india itself the final good could have been at rupees 2 or 3 isn't that so now we indians had an option in the form of our own handicraft and at that time our handicraft was very famous i'll give you a few example like kolhapuri chappal banaras banarsi saadi yavatmal saadi okay yavatmal saadi kanchipuram saadi getting the points clear dhotis and dupattas of gujarat chicken work or chicken kurta of lucknow so these were basically indian handicrafts which were quite famous at that time so we people started preferring our own handicraft now what did britishers do now to destroy our handicraft industry what did they do they drastically reduced the prices of their own goods so now indian started preferring what british good rather than preferring our own handicraft in this manner systematically our indian handicraft industry was paralyzed by the britishers got the points clear so now it was decided that import duty on cotton goods should be in, uh, what we say increased or reimposed why because our handicraft industry will get a boom again okay then there should be more expenditure okay yes dipesh Uh, military expenditure was a part of home charges as well yes very good dipesh now there should be more expenditure on the welfare of the people getting the points clear so there should be expenditure on health sanitation education agriculture related activities and so on then there should be more uh, what we say 
like there should be more what we say investment in the field of education so that more number of indians could be associated in the education basically there should be separation of judiciary from the executive and now why there should be a separation of judiciary from the executive i have already told you this power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely if more and more power is concentrated in few hands there is going to be obvious misuse of that power okay and at that time district collector can try civil cases as well as district collector was a revenue collector so he majorly he misused his power so one of the demand was separation of executive and the judiciary okay now better treatment should be given to the laborers in the other british colonies got the uh, got the points clear there should be freedom of speech there should be freedom of expression in very simple words there should be freedom of press why freedom of press because press acts as a medium it acts as a channel of communication between the government and the governed hope so the points are clear and grant of self government now what is self government let us understand this now basically it is said that uh, self government is like we are not going to detach ourselves from the britain but we will have our own sovereignty like for example we would be associated with the britain but we will have our rights we will have our independence to choose our own dignitaries like we can have our own government we can have our own ministers we can have our own prime minister council of ministers president and so on but we will be associated with the britain that is self government and for the first time this was demanded by dada bhai noro ji then it was followed by gopal krishna gokhale and then by lokmanya tilak initially lokmanya tilak had one demand swaraj is my birth right and i will have it in marathi it is called as swaraj ha maza janma saddha adhikar ahe and me he milavnas rahnar in marathi it is called or referred in this manner okay so basically swaraj is my birth right and i will have it okay like we indians are able to govern ourselves we indians are able to administer ourselves so this was a demand of lokmanya tilak initially but later on lokmanya tilak demanded self government okay yes guys are the points clear about the demands of the moderates please let me know yes very good dipesh like a dominion status yes see siddhartham basically the cases associated with the revenue the cases associated with property are civil cases and apart from that the cases associated with crime and social justice basically are criminal cases okay yes siddhartham now let us talk about the methods of moderates let us go a bit quickly now the best way to describe the method of moderates are constitutional agitation now what is constitutional agitation we are going to do everything but that should be within the constitutional limit in hindi it is called as within samvedhanik daira okay we are not going to follow any extra constitutional means for that okay now can you tell me one thing if everything could if we can get gain independence within constitutional limit why there is a need for such a huge freedom struggle isn't that so for example like there was an american revolution if every, if independence could have been gained by constitutional limit why there could have been a revolutions in the world in the form of american revolution french revolution and russian revolution so one of the demand was basically they believed in peaceful and bloodless struggle that britishers should transfer the power in a very peaceful manner do you believe that britishers are going to transfer the power in peaceful manner for the revolts they follow a very brutal policy of suppression how can they transfer the power in the peaceful manner 
can we expect the britishers to transfer the power in peaceful manner no but still moderates believed in constitutional agitation and bloodless struggle and what were their method petition resolution meeting speeches pamphlets leaflets and so on like they tried to sensitize the masses through newspaper they tried to sensitize the masses by distributing pamphlets and leaflets against the policies of the britishers and all these are the part of a fundamental right but it should be done in a very peaceful manner as per moderates okay like it is said that their policies can be summarized in three p's i repeat their policy can be summarized in three p's that is prayer protest and petition getting the points clear now moderates arranged lectures in different part of england why because at least the people of england should come to know about the plight of india like people of england believe that we are a democratic nation and we follow democratic principles and values but they should know that basically uh, britain although being a democratic country is governing other colonies in a very exploitative manner it is exploiting the people and the resources of the other colonies and the places and for that they arranged a weekly journal called as india so that the people in england could come to know about the uh, what we say condition or the plight of the people in india they arranged meeting they like they like basically they said that they believed in the concept of providential mission theory pay proper attention now what is providential mission theory providential mission theory means we are going to be loyal to the britishers we are not going to follow any extra constitutional means like although we are distributing pamphlets although we are sensitizing the masses through our newspaper although we are sensitizing the masses through the speeches we are not going to go beyond extra constitutional limit and everything would be peaceful and bloodless and we are going to maintain loyalty to the britishers and some or the other day britishers are going to repay us for our loyalty this is called as providential mission theory and this was supported by the moderates and extremists never supported this extremists completely rejected the providential mission theory because they believed that it is necessary to go for extra constitutional limit to gain independence britishers are playing the game of divide and rule they are playing the game of carrot and stick policy so here we have to go beyond the constitutional limits that was the thinking of the extremist okay so although they criticized the policies of the british through media through press through leaflet through pamphlet through speeches but still it was within constitutional limits okay now it is said that they believed in uh, patience they believed in orderly progress and so on now as i have told you they started various speeches lectures tours in england to sensitize the people of england about the plight of uh, indians basically and this like before this this was also propagated by raja ram mohan roy raja ram mohan roy also played a very crucial although he died in 1831 getting the points clear and congress was formed in 1885 like it is said that uh, congress started using the policy of sensitizing the people of england but prior to this raja ram mohan roy had also sensitized the people of england basically okay the issue of the importance of propaganda was highlighted way back in 1830s by raja ram mohan roy prior to indian national congress got the points clear now there was a person whose name was henry fawcett and he was a, a member of parliament in the british parliament he was a member of house of commons and he passed a resolution in the british parliament to conduct indian civil services examination simultaneously in india and england so henry fawcett took up the what we say issue of the moderates in the british parliament got the points clear to sensitize the masses of england there was uh, what we say national indian association being formed in england and it was formed by mary carpenter so th these are the methods that were adopted by the moderates and what were the major achievements of the moderates first of all they created a wave of nationalism among the people 
like people were sensitized about the democratic ideas now what are democratic ideas in very very simple words democracy believes in government of the people for the people and by the people so basically if the government is making rules and regulation for the people who has the authority to choose the government it is a people who have the authority to choose the government so this is the one of the cornerstone principle of democracy so people were sensitized about democratic ideas and feeling of nationalism what is nationalism feeling of belongingness towards one's own country now people were complete people completely came to know about the exploitative character of the britishers like peasant section were exploited by the britisher through land revenue policy tribal section was exploited by the britishers then educated section they were highly unemployed getting the points clear and basically the administrative post were highly reserved for the europeans and indians were racially racially discriminated this was highlighted in the revolt of 1857 britishers always followed ruthless policy of suppression for any of the movement so exploitative character of the british rule was highlighted in the front of people okay now basically there was a common political and economic ground on which people can fight against the alien rule now like in revolt of 1857 what did we see like zamindar was fighting for his own cause peasant was fighting for his own cause tribals were fighting for his own cause princes were fighting for their own cause there was no common cause now in sorry in revolt of 1857 but after the formation of a congress there was a proper direction to the movement and there was a people were fighting on a common political and economic cause against the britishers they campaigned against the authoritarianism they campaigned against obscurantism now what is authoritarianism and obscurantism like basically medieval backwardness of the indian society like for example sati system was prevalent child marriage was prevalent so apart from working for gathering people or uniting the people against the britishers congress was also fighting against various social evils okay and one of the major achievement was getting indian council act of 1892 passed by the britishers yes guys are the points clear please let me know yes jallian wala bag is one of the example of the brutal face of the britishers yes very good satya yes are the points clear about indian council act sorry uh, methods of moderates hardly 5 minutes indian council act of 1892 we will discuss are the points clear please let me know okay thank you now now basically britishers wanted to associate more indians in the uh, make in basing in basically in the decision making process or in the law making body so that indians shouldn't feel that they are not being associated in the administrative process because if continuously their demands are being rejected there can be a revolt like the 1857 so indian council act at least it marked the beginning of representative form of government now what is representative form of government indians were represented in the law making bodies indians will now frame rules and regulation for themselves now getting the points clear and now basically all the demands that we have discussed previously like basically reduction of military expenditure simultaneously exam should be conducted in of, of indian civil services in england and india so all these demands were put forward by whom moderates okay so this had created a background for this and now in basically english is sorry britishers decided to create a new law and that was nothing but in the form of indian council act of 1892 and at that time viceroy was lord dufferin and lord dufferin created a committee to create a law for enlargement of provincial council that is provincial legislative council and imperial legislative council i have told you what is imperial legislative council 
and what is provincial legislative council imperial legislative council is like the present day parliament and provincial legislative council is like the vidhan sabha and vidhan parishad now let us understand important provisions of indian council act 1892 pay proper attention number of members that is indian member i am talking about in the imperial legislative council and provincial legislative council were raised okay like for example i am giving a small example like suppose if there were initially six member in the imperial legislative council the number would be increased to 10 or 15 if there are 10 members in the provincial legislative council it would be increased to 20 or 25 so more number of members specifically the indians should be associated in the imperial legislative council and provincial legislative council now imperial legislative council can have minimum 10 member and maximum 16 member now pay proper attention all these members would not be indian suppose if there are 10 member 3 to 4 would be indian if there are 16 member 5 to 6 of them would be indians so in the imperial legislative council minimum member should be 10 and maximum should be 16 and in the provincial legislative council like bombay presidency madras presidency and bengal presidency in madras presidency 20 member should be there bengal 20 bombay 8 okay now power of legislative council was increased and how the power was increased you will systematically come to know that britishers were fooling the indian systematically how pay proper attention now indians were given the right to participate in the discussion they were they were given the right to participate in the debates on a budget basically but they were denied the right to vote upon it so what is the use of the participation in debate and discussion i'll give you a very small example suppose i am a member of imperial legislative council and there is a budget session being going on and now basically there is a discussion on what sort of what we say how much money should be spent upon military expenses now military expenses are unnecessary expenses because they are used basically for colonization practice now i told basically in the budgetary debate and discussion that these expenses should be reduced and basically the money should be spent more on the welfare scheme for the upliftment of the society for improving the efficiency of the administration now britishers are going to listen to this but whether to implement this or not it is in the hand of the britishers it is in the hand of governor general or it is in the hand of viceroy so what is the use of such a discussion isn't that so so basically budget could be discussed but there was no right to vote supplementary questions could not be asked question could be asked okay for example if there is a more and more expenditure being done on uh, buying of weapons or ammunitions or arms and ammunition now there could be a question being raised by an indian member that why so much of money is spent on the weapons like it should be spent for the welfare getting the points clear but this question could only be raised after taking the prior permission of governor general in council so what is the use of such debate and discussion if the permission needs to be taken by the governor general and who is the final authority to pass that law it is the viceroy it is the governor general it is the secretary of state for india so what is the use for such debate and discussion isn't that so but still basically we had the right for the first time to what we said discuss our grievances okay then basically it is said that basically indian members were nominated they were appointed and they were not elected i'll give you a small example suppose we have said that imperial legislative council will have minimum 10 member suppose out of 10 member 4 are indian i am giving an example out of 10 member 4 are indian now these 4 indians would not be elected they would be nominated okay and who is going to be now basically britishers were uh, either britishers were nominating them 
और बेसिकली अ बॉडी ऑफ यूनिवर्सिटी बोर्ड डिस्ट्रिक्ट बोर्ड म्युनिसिपैलिटी जमींदार चेंबर ऑफ कॉमर्स नाउ दीज पीपल आर गोइंग टू वट वी से रेकमेंड दैट हु इज गोइंग टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ इंपीरियल इंपीरियल लेजिस्लेटिव काउंसिल और प्रोविंशियल लेजिस्लेटिव काउंसिल so basically these ministers were nominated they were not elected so the will of the people who are loyal to the britishers getting the points clear were represented in the indian council act 1892 hope so the points are clear guys so although there was a representative form of government but although certain basically powers were delegated to indians but these powers are useless because we did not had the authority to use them because final authority rest in the hands of britishers no dipesh they did not had the right to vote they only had the right to discuss yes somya uh, arrival of europeans that is the first video वही है फर्स्ट वीडियो ओके यस गाइस सो डिड यू अंडरस्टैंड इंडियन काउंसिल एक्ट ऑफ 1892 ओके दीज आर सर्टेन इंपॉर्टेंट फैक्ट्स प्लीज गो थ्रू दीज फैक्ट्स दीज फैक्ट्स हैव बीन आस्ट इन वेरियस एग्जामिनेशन एंड आई एम रिपीटिंग द पॉइंट्स अगेन Like we would be, I would be conducting a test on Sunday, and there would be a special class on Buddhism on Saturday. Tomorrow, I will start with extremist section of the Indian National Congress. If you like my lectures, please subscribe to An Academy and use my code A K O U S. I repeat the code A K O U S. Okay. Immediately, I would be posting the what we say PDF on my Telegram channel. and secondly i would be posting one question on daily basis for answer writing please follow answer writing seriously okay thank you my friends and have a very very nice day yes satya india became we became servants in our own country getting the points clear yes satya you are correct okay guys thank you and have a very nice day please use my code Thank you